a great, great, great pleasure to introduce to you, well, you saw her before, but uh, then again, uh, Dame Pauline Green, the president of the International Cooperatives Alliance, that will talk to us about the future of cooperatives. So, please. Can I just start by saying that, actually, I've been really energised by what's, what I've experienced here today. And I think what we've got left is the hardcore now, which I think is right at this time of day. But I have really felt the energy and the enthusiasm and the life that is here uh, to create a different sort of economy and a different sort of life here in Israel. And it really has made me feel very excited as a, as a, a cooperator and as somebody who is working at the global level for the cooperative movement to see and experience the, uh, the sort of the, the lifeblood of the cooperative movement on the ground as I see it and hear it here is fantastic. And I want to say thank you to Yifat in particular because um, we met twice, I think, last year. One, the first time in Helsinki in February. See, it's ingrained in my mind. Um, when she first told me what was happening here in Israel, which was very, very exciting. Still isn't there. Um, and, uh, uh, and then again in Manchester when she gave me the update and uh, said, would I come? And I was very, very keen to come here uh, and take part in this event. And I've got, now got a whole program in Israel and indeed in Palestine as well uh, over the next few days, but it's all built around being here today for this event. So thank you very much for letting me take part in what has been a hugely powerful event for me, personally. So I am hoping that, the, uh, that these are going to come on, because otherwise, oh, I should be sad. <laughs> but let me, let me begin um, by saying that um, uh, it, I'm enormously privileged to be uh, the president of the International Cooperative Alliance. And I want to start by giving you some idea of what the International Cooperative Alliance is. And I can see that the ones around the, the sides actually are working. It's so it's being taken care of. OK, that's not, uh, well, shall we start so I can just get on? Otherwise, because I don't want to, uh, to, to keep you for an hour and a quarter talking, just to wait for them to come up, because you can watch it on there. Um, the International Cooperative Alliance, um, so I thought I'd start by explaining to you what it is. So the ICA, what is it? The ICA is formally an independent, non-governmental organisation which unites, represents and serves cooperatives worldwide. Now we are an organisation of cooperatives. Okay? So our members are key cooperatives around the world. And I think it's important, having listened to the last debate, which I thought was fascinating, I'm a political animal too, as you've gathered from my history. I was a politician uh, for many years. Uh, and I related to a lot of that discussion. But I have to say to you that uh, cooperatives, I would say, are not going to solve all of those problems. Many of those problems require political settlements, political action to settle them, and cooperatives are not going to do that. But what really moved me over the period which brought you together, the protest movement here in Israel but in other parts of the world, uh, what really moved me was the sense that people, whether they were on the streets of, uh, of, of um, uh, the Arab countries, whether they were on the Occupy movement, in Los Indignados, all those people protesting were actually moved by wanting either to remove despots, dictators, and change their political system, but also to bring about a fairer economic system. They wanted something in which their voice could be heard. You saw it in New York, in Wall Street, and all around, all, all around uh, the Western world. They wanted to have a say. They wanted to have an impact on the way in which the economy grew in their country. Uh, and for me, the cooperative movement offers them that opportunity to do that. And as far as I'm aware, this is the only movement here in Israel that has come out of the protest movement and sat down and is doing something constructive and grassroots and self-help. And that's really what makes it so energizing and exciting for me. So the ICA is there to represent the cooperative movement globally. But it's not just about size of business, and I will show you later, we represent huge businesses and tiny little businesses. Um, but it's also about 
the fact that our cooperatives are businesses, and I want to be very clear about that, because what was invented by either the Raffaison model, that, that is what led to all the financial cooperatives, whether it be banks or credit, uh, credit unions around the world, or whether it be the Rochdale pioneers who established the first shop uh, in Rochdale and codified the principles of our movement, um, what they tried to do uh, was to set out a model of business that would actually change the world, because that's what it was about. So when you're looking to change the world, um, the cooperative movement made up of, organ of businesses or enterprises, call it wh whichever you prefer, in the English terms these days, cooperative business is a perfectly acceptable term because it's actually about making sure that our cooperatives are acting in a business-like manner which would allow us to create a profit or in the old style, a surplus which we can then return to our social and environmental uh, agendas. So it's about, it's about making surpluses or profits. It's what we do with them and who controls them and who says where they're going that makes us as a movement so different. So the, the important thing for you to know is that no matter about the size of our business success commercially, the key thing for me is that people lie at the heart of the economic decision-making of cooperatives. There is no clearer way to see the distinction between us and companies and corporations than to say that a company and a corporation is constitutionally duty-bound to maximise their profitability to return it to their shareholders. A cooperative is constitutionally duty-bound to meet the needs of its members. And that means it doesn't have to chase, it doesn't have to involve itself in the red-blooded chase for profitability. Some very big co-ops that I have seen across the world spend millions and millions and millions of US dollars on their democracy. In any accepted definition, of economic efficiency in the world today, that would be a waste of money. And one of the things that the ICA is now working to do is to create for all the use of all cooperatives around the world a new definition that we can, that we can all stand behind, in, that we regard as much more appropriate for our cooperative model of enterprise. A, a redefinition of efficiency in the economy. And it has to be about a lot more than just the, the search for profitability as it's become in the last four or five decades. It's got to be about much more than that. It's got to be about good industrial relationships because some cooperatives employ people who are not necessarily members. It's got to be about ethics in business. It's got to be about engaging and getting people to participate in your business. It's got to be about the reduction and elimination of poverty. It's got to be about supporting what the growth of prosperity in communities. In our view, all these things are an integral part of what should be the definition of efficiency in our economic system. So the role of the ICA is to pursue all that at global level, but we're conscious that our movement across the world, and this is an absolutely vital issue uh, and statistic, our movement across the world is owned by over a billion of the world's citizens. Okay? I was hearing today about how you're too small here in Israel to do things. There is nothing that you can think of here in Israel that doesn't already exist somewhere in the world. You don't have to reinvent the wheels. It's out there for you. And we will help you to find the people that you can talk to, the rabbit banks of this world, uh, to help you with your banks, the housing cooperative specialists, the people who run uh, production co uh, cooperatives, the people who run health cooperatives, educational cooperatives, agricultural cooperatives, whatever. I mean, your kibbutz movement has done the business on agricultural co-ops. You don't need support, but, but you know what I mean. Anything you might think of doing is being done somewhere in the world. And we, um, we are, uh, we're in contact with just about all of them. 
So we're owned by over a billion of the world's citizens. A billion people have chosen to be a member of a cooperative because it puts food in their children's stomachs, it takes them to school, it grows their food, it looks after their banking, it insures them when other people wouldn't. That's what cooperatives do in the real economy. That's why it's so critical to so many people's lives. And we employ, together as cooperatives, over 100 million people across the world. I'm forgetting about these, of course. Owned by a billion people. I see Ray down there is saying to be moving on, you silly woman. Um, owned by a billion people. We employ 100 million uh, people together across the world. And the ICA is made up of cooperative representatives from 100 countries across the world. So we have cooperatives everywhere. We've still a few countries to work on, but, but we have cooperatives in just about every part of the world. So what is the ICA? It was established in 1895. It is, in fact, the, one of the largest and oldest non-governmental organisations, NGOs, in the world. We have over 260 national and international members in all sectors of the economy from over uh, 100 countries. And I have to tell you, when I say 260, you probably think, what? That's not so many. But each of those 260 will be a federation with hundreds, sometimes hundreds of thousands of cooperatives in membership. In India, for instance, the largest cooperative country by number of primary cooperatives, there are 600,000 plus cooperatives in India. Okay? So you can see what I mean. There are many, many cooperatives. The ICA represents 93% of the 1 billion members through its 260 members. We want to get the rest, but we're working on that. And we have consultative status with the United Nations. We are one of the first, well, we were in the first, in the treaty, we were in the, uh, the UN treaty, we were written in as one of the NGOs that they would work with and give consultative status to. So we have a seat uh, in negotiations at, in the United Nations. The statement of cooperative identity, I think most of you will know this, um, our cooperatives are member-owned enterprises across the world who, which adhere to the values and principles of the cooperative movement. And these, as you will know, are the seven principles. Voluntary and open membership, really important. Democratic member control, really important. The ICA is made up of organisations where there's not full democratic member control. We are the one of the only NGOs in the world that have managed to keep people from all countries, from all religious um, uh, traditions across the world together. During the Cold War, we had people from the Soviet countries and people from the West, even though their cooperative movement was inevitably, during that period, part of their communist systems. They stayed with us, we stayed with them, we as I do now, I go to China, which has a big cooperative movement, and I talk to them about the need for cooperatives to be independent of government. And I was privileged last year to be invited to speak in the Great Hall of the People in Tiananmen Square with the Deputy Prime Minister of China, and I said it there in front of 300 officials of the Chinese government. Cooperatives, modern cooperatives, must be independent of government, and government's role is to enable cooperatives, not to control them. So it's important that we say these things, but recognise that they, they, in my view, are in a transition state to, to something that will allow their... And to be fair, their movement is trying to pressure uh, for certain changes in government, uh, government policy. Member economic participation, critical part of the principles of the co-op movement. Autonomy and independence. It is vital that we have empowering, enabling legislation, but it does not, governments do not seek to control. And in many African countries, this is a serious issue. And, and I work with some of those movements to try and get their governments off their back and give them the freedom that the cooperative movement deserves. Education and training is a vital part of the, uh, the principles of cooperation, as is cooperation amongst cooperatives. So we try to work together. And I think it's critical, as you emerge through this new generation of cooperatives, that you are building here, 
that you make sure that you try your best to keep the movement together because together you can make this really something so powerful in this country with your traditions and history of cooperation and you indeed could be the catalyst that brings cooperation back to life in this country as it used to be. So I think it's a very exciting opportunity and concern for the community of course which is keeping our cooperatives in their own communities, bringing the wealth back into those communities that the cooperatives generate and, and leaving it with the people from whom the wealth uh, came if you like. So it's an important set of principles. What about the values? Self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equality, equity and solidarity. The principles uh, of the modern cooperative movement. I wanted to give you just this quote from Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, who said, cooperatives are a reminder to the international community that it is possible to pursue both economic viability and social responsibility. It's a very important statement from a man uh, who leads the United Nations and is evocative of a lot of the things that come out of the UN. And just one more, if I can give it to you. This comes from the background paper to the UN World Summit on Social Development, where they said, cooperatives contribute directly to improving the standards of living of half the world's population. And we're talking over three billion people who in one way or another find their standard of living protected by cooperatives. That is hugely important. And this is the sort of, these are the sort of statements and the sort of thinking that led to the United Nations developing the International Year of Cooperatives, which of course was 2012 last year. This was our gift, a gift to the cooperative movement from the United Nations. And the ICA had worked very hard for three decades to achieve the International Year status. And it has opened up doors which have never been opened before to the cooperative movement. Even we have taken the cooperative movement to the top of Mount Everest. And what you see here uh, is the, the Director General of the Nepal Co Central Cooperative Union, who with eight of his colleagues on the 26th of May last year at six o'clock in the morning reached uh, the summit of Everest and unfurled firstly the ICA colours, which we were thrilled about, but also uh, the International Year of Cooperatives logo. They felt it was something they could do that nobody else in the world could do. And it actually became one of the iconic images the iconic images of last year for the entire cooperative movement. It was, it was very evocative and uh, perhaps a bit above and beyond the call of duty. So what was the International Year about? I think, first of all, we need to say that from the ICA's perspective, which was tasked with, the, with running this International Year for the movement, we had one very simple and main overriding aim. And that was to use the international year to kickstart the growth again of the cooperative movement. It was growing anyway, but to give it new vitality, the sort of thing we've seen here, the new, a new uh, energy to grow this movement in a world that desperately needs it. Because of course this international year coincided with the financial crisis and the loss of confidence in the, the capitalist uh, market that we had seen all around us. And I told you earlier about how our uh, cooperative institutions had come through that. That has been recognised, our financial institutions, that has been recognised by commentators across the world. It's made a huge impact uh, on uh, the, uh, uh, the, the global institutions, which is where I'm tasked with working for the movement, but also on major politicians who are doing things like the G20, the G20, the, the lar 20 largest economies in the world. This is an informal grouping of countries. It isn't part of the UN, the G20. It's an informal grouping of the 20 largest countries' economies in the world. Uh, and those largest economies are actually uh, establishing between them the direction in which the world's economy goes. Sitting alongside the G20 is something called the B20, a business advisory group that advises the G20. I went through, on the, online, the profile of every one of the 125 businesses that went to the B20 to advise the G20 at the last meeting. Not one of them 
was cooperative or even mutual. Now, we are going to stop that. And we're working very hard now with the people who are about to take on the presidency uh, of the G20, the Australian government, and they, we are working very hard to try and ensure that the next time round, uh, uh, there, there will be cooperative and mutual businesses represented in the B20, giving direct voice to our one billion people with those governments who are dictating the direction of the global economy. So similarly, there is nobody on the World Bank who has any notion, not an economist of any, who has any notion of the cooperative, uh, unique nature of the cooperative model of business, our financial structure, our legal structure. That has to stop. It cannot go on. The voice of a billion people is not represented in the World Bank that is, once again, ad ad advocating how, uh, how we eliminate poverty. I was invited by Rabobank to make a speech at a, at a fringe meeting of the, World, of the World Bank and IMF Forum in Tokyo last year, uh, where we made the case that actually, I was able to make the case that actually the world donors, the public donors, have actually been part of the problem of failing the co-op movement. Because in Africa, for instance, they use cooperatives as a vehicle to send money down to the farmers. And when the money stops, the, the cooperative goes. They're not building sustainable cooperatives with cooperators on the ground. They're just saying, oh, we don't want the money to go through the government, corruption and all that, so we'll develop a cooperative and pass it through. But there's nothing sustainable. There's nothing, uh, no participation. There's no growth and training of how to run a business for those people, just here's your money. And when the money goes, the co-op goes. The people at the bottom end think the co-ops failed them. And because it's not sustainable when they leave, the World Bank thinks it's a failure too. So I was able to say to them, you are part of the problem actually, and you need to change that structure. You need to work through the movement that knows how to make this a long-term sustainable future. What's the outcome of the International Year for the Movement? The outcome is that we are left as a global movement with a much stronger sense of our own cohesion. It's been really exciting for the ICA to see the way in which the movement now understands its size and significance already and how much more it can still do. There's been a huge growth in the confidence of the movement. For too long, the movement spoke to itself. Now it's speaking out to the rest of the world. Now it wants to talk to the rest of the world and to start talking about what more we can do to grow the cooperative family of businesses to help ordinary folk get a, get a better say in the economy and to have a better life. And the key thing for the ICA now is to maintain the momentum that we gained during the international year. Maintain it and grow it as we move forward. Last year, when I had this great privilege to present uh, the uh, cooperative movement's position at the opening of the international year, in the General Assembly of the United Nations, I was able to lay out the three key planks of our public policy priorities. They're very basic, as you will see. Diversification of the global economy. Is there any question any longer in anybody's mind that the global economy needs to be diversified? Our domin the dominance of the global economy by one model of business has to end. And there's a lot of acceptance now of that around the world and, and with some um, Nobel Prize winning economists actually making that case as well, which is very exciting and, and, and hopeful. But we need to keep driving it, pushing it right in their face because they don't see us on the stock markets as businesses, so we don't exist. The one billion cooperators don't exist because they can't see them on the stock markets of the world. So we, it is our responsibility to be much more the public advocates of our business and to put our model of enterprise right up there so they can no longer ignore us. We have to diversify the global economy, which means diversifying your national economies too, which is what you're about here today and why it's so exciting. We need to have the recognition of our unique legal and financial structure because they don't understand it. 
They simply don't. And I had this experience when I left the European Parliament, went back to work for the co-op movement in the UK, and I took somebody into a Labour government in the UK, spoke to their economic advisor, to the Prime Minister Tony Blair, and he didn't understand what a cooperative was. That, that is beyond belief. And in fact, in some of the emerging nations, what I call the airplane economies, the Brazils, the Chinas, the Indias of this world, their governments do actually get what a cooperative is. They do. And we find ourselves speaking to a much more receptive audience when we speak to them. Um, and, and if our colleagues from the Knesset were still here, I would say to them that, that when I spoke in China, it was fascinating to hear them say that actually the 25-year objective of the Chinese government, if you're a politician, 25 years is beyond thinking. Most Western democracies, they work on a planning cycle of about two years to the next election planning starts. But the Chinese, with their one-party state, 25-year objective is to push down the wealth in the cities of China to the 600 million people living in rural poverty in China. And they believe cooperatives are a vital component to do that. So you can see the sort of approach that people have across the world. And the third key frank, um, plank of our, uh, of our public policy priorities was to get equal promotion uh, for the cooperative model of business with the shareholder model. Because we know they talk about um, all sorts of uh, uh, regimes for business, and by default, they write out cooperatives. And that happens in regional, local, national, and global um, funding regimes and regimes for development around the world. We have to stop that. In my country, as I told you earlier, you can't have a bank as a cooperative. Why not? Accident of history. And now our Prime Minister said to us, uh, and the Conservative Prime Minister said to us last year during the international year when he saw the way in which the mutual and cooperative banks in the rest of Europe had come through the crisis so well, he's saying, why don't we have cooperative banks here? Ah, the penny drops. So we have to change that and we have to make sure there's equal promotion for our model of business and our understanding of our legal and financial structure and we need to diversify the global economy. It's not rocket science, any of it. But it's what we have got to do. We've got to keep making that argument because the reason they don't know is because we cooperators have let, them, let you all down in the past five, six decades. It stopped happening. Where are the business schools that teach about cooperatives? They don't exist very much, huh? Where are the bodies of accountants who know what a co-op is and who can advise on the street? There isn't any. Solicitors to incorporate co-ops cheaply and easily. There isn't any. So this happens all over the world, this is problems, and that's because the established movement let go of this when it came under attack and it was defending its interests, rightly. And, and I actually think that whilst you may say here uh, that the cooperative movement in terms of the established movement failed to some extent, it did a really good job for the beginning of the State of Israel. And, and it's done a good job all around the world. But we went through a very difficult patch for four or five decades, and it became defensive. Now it's time to grow, and it's happening. There's a renaissance all over the world, and you here are a critical part of that. So let's, let me tell you. Let me tell you about some of the initiatives that have happened. Dot co-op. If you're a cooperative, you get a dot co-op domain name. It's the trusted domain name on the internet. It's not free. It's free when you first get it, but you will have to renew it. Your first year is free, but you'll have to renew it. I can tell you the ICA has just been gift-aided two of the three businesses that run dot co-op by a co-op in the UK who said, this is much more an international thing. We want you to have it. So they've given us those businesses. We're now working with the Americans who own the third bit, uh, a cooperative organization. And together, we're going to change the structure to bring down the cost of... Because if you're, if you're saying this is a trusted domain, you have to be able to be sure you're only letting co-ops have the names. That has a cost attached to it. So we're trying, we will try in the next, in the next 18 months, you will see a new model of marketing being rolled out, um, which I hope is going to drive our domain name higher up the list of, of domains. But it's easy, you can transfer to it. 
you know, some of the biggest co-ops in the world are now .coop, and if you're going to get a domain name, please use a cooperative one. So these, this is how our visibility and our public policy is going forward. The Rio Plus 20 big event last year uh, to look after the planet, environmental sustainability is absolutely vital. You would have thought in the International Year of Cooperatives that the United Nations would have included the role of cooperatives in sustainability. Over 200 years we've been embedding civil society, good practices, supporting uh, the, the, the globe across the world. Never mentioned cooperatives, never mentioned it. We have a huge process of uh, renewable energy in the cooperative movement. It's growing incredibly year on year. Never mentioned it. So we put our policy advocate, our policy uh, our officer onto them, took up our seat for the first time in decades at, at, the, at the United Nations for nine months. Uh, and, and we went to every meeting with the countries met to discuss the Rio Plus 20 treaty. And with the help of some of the governments, we managed to get mention of the cooperative in the final text. I have to tell you, I don't think the Rio Plus 20 treaty is anywhere near good enough. I think we would all agree on that. But the fact is that we managed to get in the treaty recognition of the cooperative movement's role in sustainable agriculture, in job creation, and in, in, in international development. And that has allowed us now to advise our national memberships how to use that treaty now to have a role in performing uh, in, in climate and climate change initiatives. Because the UN has said we have a role, all the countries signed up to it, and so we believe it's a way now to use it. Secondly, second big policy, the way in which we've changed our public policy approach, we are now developing a partnership with the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. I don't know whether you're aware, but in 2050, there will be nine billion people on this planet. And there is not enough agricultural land in productive agricultural use to feed nine billion people. The most of the land that is currently unproductive resides in sub-Saharan Africa, in the hands of smallholder farmers or peasant farmers. Already we see multinational businesses and predatory states buying up some of that African land for the future. And when I was once again in uh, Tokyo at the invitation of Rabobank, the whole essence of my speech was that if we start now, I was, and it was accompanied by an excellent report from Rabobank, if we start now, we can actually build a cooperative agricultural economy right across sub-Saharan Africa, build the supply chains, the cooperative supply chains, and by 2050, we will have that land productive and able to support and feed uh, the nine billion people who will be on the planet. And the benefits will go to the African people, not multinational businesses or predatory states. And that's what we're about, changing the world, making the world a better place. And the Food and Agricultural Organization are so taken with this initiative that they're signing a partnership agreement with us to feed Africa, as they put it. As well as that, we decided the International Year needed a legacy in the hands of the co-op movement. So we we've formed something called the Global Development Cooperative, which is a trust fund. And we're trying to bring the largest cooperatives in the world to invest in that fund to raise 50 million US dollars, on the back of which we're already promised substantial uh, additional funding from USAID and from the European Development Fund to help us build cooperatives across the world in the developing world. And that money as well will largely go to Africa, but not only Africa, in places where development, a case for development can be made. Uh, and certainly in some of these this parts of the world, uh, I think there's a case to be made uh, for that fund and the money that goes with it. And that's moving on. Uh, and it's been launched. It has money in the fund. It's growing. And we've had some very, very lively and interesting discussions, particularly with the Americans. Credit union movement in America is seeking to invest heavily. And on the back of, U of US funding, the um, US aid will also come in. I want to tell you about the size of our movement, and, and we last year launched the World Cooperative Monitor, which shows the size and reach and significance of the largest cooperatives in the world. I want you to know what you're part of. 
so that you can actually say, actually, the co-op movement of 200 years ago is today worth this much. Because these are the cooperatives that began life as small cooperatives 170 to 200 years ago. We have now a database at the end of last year after, um, after uh, partnering with Eurixi, the European Research for Cooperatives and Social Enterprise um, at the University of Trento. We, have a, we had a database at the end of last year of 2,190 co-ops from 61 countries. Uh, they're the largest we could find. The end of this year, we will have the largest 5,000. And, and you can see the size of those 2,000 odd cooperative businesses there. Of those 2,000 odd, nearly 1,500 are businesses over with a turnover over 100 million US dollars. So you're talking about some very significant cooperative businesses. It should not be too hard to raise 50 million US dollars from this lot, frankly. Of course, it is proving hard, but we will get the money. Um, and, and then the top 300, which we started listing a few years ago. This is a much more rigorously um, enabled, the top 300, from the, now that we're working with the university. But what it enables us to do is to actually start talking to those people who say cooperatives are little uh, rural things that just deal with poor people. Of course, we do that and we're proud of it, but they tend to dismiss us. Boutique businesses, tiny little things, um, no strategic importance, old-fashioned. This is not true. The top 300 businesses in the world have turnover between them of nearly 2 trillion US dollars. Big businesses. Uh, coming from, I think, 24 countries, 24 countries, in many different sectors of the economy, agriculture, banking, insurance, health, worker co-ops, uh, consumer co-ops, you name it, a whole range of different cooperatives. And I think there was one Israeli cooperative at number 300, which was the, the one we're seeing tomorrow, Granot, Granot. Um, I don't know whether it's still at 300 this coming year, but it was there. Uh, uh, but this is, it's important that we recognise the size of our movement commercially. This is the language that economists and commentators talk about. And we have to be able to say to them, we don't need any lessons in how to run multi-billion pound businesses. Many of these businesses are very active in advocating their cooperative essence. Many of them. When you couple that with the billion people, the voice of the billion, which we represent together, and couple it again, partner it again, with this website, stories.coop, where you will find last year, the international year, one story a day of a different co-op from anywhere in the world. Really nice, nice cooperative stories, some very inspirational stories from, from difficult parts of Africa that have come out of genocide, and some really fabulous stories of innovative young people's cooperatives, but there's, there, and we're still building that. There were so many stories coming in, there are still more going on. Perhaps not one a day, but they're still growing. So if you need evidence, go to that website and look at it. It'll make you feel very good about the movement you're part of. So this is the final part of what I want to say. So where are we going now? Well, when we started the International last year, the ICA also launched a, uh, a working group to set up to come out with a vision for the future. So that we didn't, at the end of the year, you know, clap ourselves on the back and say, well, that's it, finished. But we had something to take us forward, something to grow the movement going forward. And we have it. It was adopted in Manchester at the final meeting for the movement of the international year. 12,000 members from all around the world present in Manchester for that event. Um, and uh, it was a, a, a really tremendous event. And we adopted what we've called the blueprint for uh, the cooperative, a, a cooperative decade. And it has as its major ambition that by 2020, the cooperative model of enterprise will be the fastest growing model of business in the world. You, you will recognize that this is a very ambitious agenda, but I have to say to you, if we can't be ambitious at this moment, whenever are we going to be? After the financial collapse, when people are uh, in despair about their children's future, their own future, their community's future, their environmental future, when that is all around them, we have something different to offer. 
We have a different way that allows them a voice, that allows them to secure uh, their local environment initially, uh, building that bridge between the local and the global, giving them a sense of security and well-being in their own environment because they're building it, they're growing it, they're keeping the prosperity. That's what matters for the cooperative movement and that's what matters for people. So what is the blueprint? It developed five key themes, none of them once again rocket science, but the areas where we need to concentrate to grow the movement. Firstly, participation. The cooperative model of business is the most participatory form of enterprise in the world. Democratic participation, democratic ownership. What we want to do now is extend that. Use new technology, build a cooperative movement that is happy to open up discussions about its own model of business to non-cooperators, in a viral sense, on the internet, over new, uh, the social media. Never jeopardizing the members' rights to decide, but opening up the discussion, because in that way you'll bring people in to the cooperative movement. Let's start up our own online university that are growing now across the world. We've got a wonderful source, resource available in what happens in cooperatives across the world to, to do 15-minute participatory engaging slots about what cooperative economics, cooperative business is like and how it runs. Let's bring people in to, to our ambits. And our key theme, uh, our key objective on this theme is to elevate participation within membership and governance to a new level. Let's not just sit there and say we are the best in the world. Let's increase it and grow it and use what happens now. And that's why young people are so vital to the blueprint. Written throughout it, it says we need the youth of the world to understand what the cooperative model of business offers to them. That's why this is such an exciting uh, place to be right now. The second area, sustainability. Sustainability. You know, when people think of sustainability, they don't think of cooperatives front to mind yet. They need to. And our key, uh, uh, key objective is to position cooperatives as builders of sustainability. And it's not just environmental sustainability. It's in all the ways I was talking about earlier. But one of the things we're doing now, and I, you know, I said earlier that we need to redefine efficiency, and we are actually putting out a paper to, uh, to getting some of this work done to redefine this concept of efficiency uh, in business so that we can say to the media, and we can, we can say to our members, it'll be an, a, a, a good, solid, academic research paper, but it will have a strong, practical element so our members can look at their own profitability and use this argument that actually our sustainability is as a business, we're sustaining the planet through our uh, uh, environmental policies, uh, we're sustaining good labour relations through the way we run our business, we're good governance, ethical approach and so on and so forth, community engagement, that's where we need to be. And that's the second key theme uh, of the blueprint. The third is identity. We have to make sure that we build our cooperative identity and put out a strong message about who we are. And you know, it's the United Nations gave us this strong sense of cohesion because we asked everybody to use the international logo and slogan, and they did. All over the world, it appeared in so many languages, the UN slogan and logo, many languages, uh, um, on many things, on distribution trucks, on shopping bags, on teacups, on, on, on the web, on brochures, everywhere. And what was so exciting about that is that we felt we needed to follow this on and to make sure we grow this and, and keep something that will give us that cohesion as well. And we started consulting on what people would like to see in a common cooperative mark that would identify that this product, this service, this website, this brochure came from a cooperative. So we sent out a survey to cooperatives and we got responses unprecedented from 86 countries. So they want a common mark. And in the General Assembly that we're having in Cape Town in November, the first General Assembly on the African continent of the, of the international cooperative movement, we will launch the new cooperative mark and the new uh, identity for the International Cooperative Alliance. And we believe over five to ten years that it's an identity mark 
uh, and, and it, it will demonstrate that this is a, from a cooperative business and we want people to use it all over the world. So that will be revealed uh, in uh, Cape Town. Then we've got to make sure the messages behind it are the right ones and put them out to the UN, all across the world, all of us, using the same messages, making sure it's loud and clear. Uh, and our key theme, our key objective on identity is to build the cooperative message and secure the cooperative identity. Understand what is the irreducible core of cooperation and make those messages loud and clear. Uh, the, fifth, the fourth one is legal frameworks. We've talked a bit about that today. There is still sometimes discrimination by default, but there's discrimination against the cooperative model of business. And sometimes it's quite overtly done deliberately. Uh, we've seen it happen in the EU where three countries, the co-op movement came under attack for the tax relief they gave uh, their cooperative movement, and it was regarded, uh, and there was a complaint to the European Union that it was actually a state aid, which is not allowed under European law. Uh, and these were coming from the private sector, these attacks, on the cooperative sector in France, in Spain, and in Italy. It was quite deliberate, they all happened at the same time, it was a clear campaign by private sector businesses. So we have to be alert that these things are happening. It was ever thus with the cooperative model of business, because we are a threat. We are a threat to what they're trying to achieve, because our aim is that people will prefer the cooperative model of business, uh, and that, of course, is something that they can't let go, and they can't allow to happen without a fight. So it's important that we get a legal framework where you can make a case for a cooperative business. There should be no reason why you can't have that cooperative business by law. So good legal frameworks. And the final, oh, there's, the, there's the, the key objective, ensure supportive legal frameworks for cooperative growth. The final, the fifth theme, is the most difficult and long-term one, it's capital. Across the cooperative world, there are always problems of funding. We are not on the stock markets. We cannot raise money from the stock markets. So cooperatives have to raise money from members or from borrowings. And in modern business, as you start to grow as a cooperative, sometimes that's not enough, actually. Because you don't want to raise, borrow it. You may not be able to raise the level of money you want from your members to grow your business, to diversify it. And you may not want to have yourself so heavily geared with debt uh, that, you become, uh, that life becomes impossible to sustain your cooperative agenda. Because to be a successful cooperative, you have to be a successful cooperative business. Okay, that's important. So the important thing for us now is working with a group of key strategic thinkers that we are now gathering from around the world who are good on cooperative finance, bringing them together and starting the thinking about how we can find some way of introducing or thinking about how we develop cooperative capital in a, in a variety of ways, critically, that does not damage cooperative structures and does not damage cooperative ownership. And that's the vital ingredient. So those are the five themes. And um, when you put them all together, you can see they're not rocket science, but it is exciting if you think how we might develop them. That's the future of the cooperative movement as we see it. So for capital, it's securing reliable cooperative capital while guaranteeing member control. So there are the, four, the five themes. This hasn't come about by accident. It's come about after long, year-long research engagement with members all over the world. And we believe the way we approach this was to ask our members, where do they see their business in 20, 30, 40 years' time? And then work back to find out what the ICA needs to do globally, regionally, nationally to secure that vision for our members because the ICA is not there for the ICA or to build an empire. It's there to grow the cooperative family of businesses, autonomous, local, locally owned, locally controlled businesses. Colleagues, working together, we can make this happen. Working together, the multitude of cooperatives can eat the big fish. We know we can do it, but I have to say to you that we can only do it if we work together. And what last year showed us, all across the world, 
is the value of working together. And it really has worked, and we're going to drive that momentum, and we're going to be the fastest growing model of business by 2020. Thank you very much. It's clear the mood is with us at the moment. The mood politically, the public mood music out there, if you know what I mean by that, is, is, is right for the cooperative model of business. Uh, when you start talking to people, they love it. You can see their eyes light up. You know, I had a discussion when I first came into the co-op movement from the European Parliament, when I came back to the movement. I tried to do what someone was talking about here earlier, establish a, a care of the elderly. And I went to speak to 50 care workers in a municipality in the UK. And they were sitting there very cynical. And they said, well, what would the co-op do for us for this? What would the co-op do for that? And I'm saying to them, the co-op won't do anything because you will be the co-op. You will decide. And by the end of that evening, the, these women, there was 49 women and one man, uh, and they were so excited. They were sitting in little groups, planning how they'd organise their times, their management, what they'd do. And it, was, it, it raised the hair on the back of the neck, if you know what I mean. It was so energising. And I thought that's what the co-op movement's about. It's the sort of thing that, that we've been thinking about in terms of the longer term capital raising and whatever, is we have already, it's already on the agenda, but we'll, we'll do that. The second point you made about, um, uh, we, have, we are discussing how, because the, the ICA is an organization of organizations. Uh, and uh, of course, for us to, to, to be able to say, uh, to give you a card that says I'm a member of the global cooperative family, with perhaps some stuff on the back would be great, and we would love to do it, but it depends on the local cooperatives being willing to do that. And now we can push it through them. It can be a jointly branded, you know, uh, thing. Um, and, and there is demand. People want to be, they want to engage. So uh, it's one of the things that the, the ICA's board is just coming to the end of its first four year, of its four year um, uh, tenure mandates. So I think it's one of the things that'll come up next time because we won't take any serious initiatives before the General Assembly. Well, you see, that's another important thing. Um, and in the, in the United Kingdom, I come up to the examples I know, and I know my own home ones better, but this, this may be happening in other parts of the world. There are many large municipalities that are now signing up to be cities of cooperation, cooperative cities. I went to speak in the city of Southampton, which is a major city in the UK, uh, whose municipality have, uh, who want to be and have signed an, a map passed a uh, resolution to be a cooperative city. Uh, as you know, in the UK, we are, have, we are having huge austerity stuff, same as you're experiencing here, with the government of the same mindset as you've got here. Um, and um, they're pulling back on funding for municipalities seriously. And the municipalities, some of them under labour control, are thinking very imaginatively about how they can defend their citizens, not themselves and their political role, but their citizens, by changing the role of the municipality. So the municipality becomes the steward of the activities, not necessarily the deliverer. And the delivery mechanism should be a preferred, a preferred option with the cooperative movement so that they would deliver some of the municipal services that they are being forced to downsize and they don't want to reduce. The issue is how can, because I want to say this to you after the discussion I heard today, the cooperative model is not necessarily the cheapest. It should aim to be the best. It should aim to be the best. And I think if you're gonna do that, and I think we must if we want to work and be successful, then what we've got to find is a way of funding that which is, which, has, which is new. So if the government is saying to the local municipalities, you've got less money to run your social care now, and they're saying, the municipality, and I said this to the council leader, you cannot say to us, run this on that little bit of money, which the municipality can't run it on because it's too, not giving you enough. It's not giving them enough. How can the co-op movement run it on that? You know, it's difficult. So what we need to do is look at creative, creative, because the, the co-op movement is incredibly creative. And I was suggesting to them things like mutual funds. You establish a mutual fund in a city for people to have their social care, for, to, to invest in their social care, those who can. 
you, the detail of this has to be worked out. But then you have the municipality providing a chunk of money and supported by a mutual fund, which is obviously invested sensibly to, to help ensure that there's... And you're beginning to get some different ideas about... Because it's all done through a cooperative structure where members are in control. The members who are benefiting from it are in control. So we need to find some other ways of doing that which allows the ownership of these services to still be with the people. But because they can't be through a municipality which can't afford to do it properly for its members, it can be through a joint structure. In some way, the co-op movement adds something. You know, this is what we have to... These are the sort of things... Lots of things have been tried throughout the world. Social services. Social co-ops grew out of northern Italy. Fabulous cooperatives, social care cooperatives in northern Italy. Everyone in the world has copied them. They're fabulous. So there are all sorts of ways in which we can build that um, cooperative cities uh, uh, and cooperative culture into, into uh, a whole community. Start small, grow, um, but, but there is now some very in, in, uh, in this really new initiatives coming forward on how we begin to, to develop cooperatives in a, in a wider context of governance of a local area. So some of our local authorities are now bulk buying the energy for all their citizens. So suddenly, instead of everybody having a contract with the electricity and gas people, the municipality is saying, we'll do it for everybody and then we've got the volume to get your prices dropped incredibly. So the city of Manchester is buying electricity for all its citizens, bulk buying, developing all over the country now in the UK through a cooperative of local citizens. It, it's fantastic. So these are the things that can really make a difference to people's standard of living. And we just got to try and think about how you can use cooperatives in these sort of ways, I think. Well, the, co the cooperative movement, as it grows, becomes a representative democracy. So what you, what you have is, you know, the very large co-ops whether it be Credit Mutuel, whether it be the cooperative group in the UK, whether it be uh, Desjardins, probably Rabobank as well, I'm not so sure of your structures, but, but generally speaking, they have meetings around the country. Uh, so some of them have multiple annual meetings where everybody from a certain region is invited to attend. Um, they vote on the resolutions before the annual meeting, and they're not declared until they're all put together at the final one. So you, you, some representative democracies are like that. Some of them uh, elect people to regional boards, then to national boards. It's a representative democracy, but everybody is able to join in that and engage in that. And that's what I say. Some large cooperatives are spending millions and millions and millions of what should be, in, in the private sector's mind, their profits uh, on their democracy, which I think is valid and valuable. If you're going to be a cooperative, you want to be dem democratic, then you have to do that. But, you know, if you're small and you're all in a co-op together, you can all do it. As you start to grow, you have to find... And if you don't, the major reason for cooperative failures is because you have forgotten to activate your membership. So one of the things I was constantly saying when I was Chief Executive of Cooperatives UK is to go round to the boards and say, you need to have contested elections here. Why has your chairman been chairman for 40 years? That's not democracy, it's institutional capture. You have to change that. So these are the sort of things that you need in a cooperative movement. And you, you know, it's, it's in, incumbent on us all to make sure that cooperatives retain strong, active membership policies. Thank you very much. Thank you.